Yo, 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 what's up everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again, another fantastic indie comic interview. It is your host, Cody, and we are keeping it geekly with Madeline Holly Rosing. Welcome to tonight's stream. How are you doing? And I'm thank doing great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh, stopping on and giving us a breakdown of your brand new Kickstarter for Boston Metaphysical Society Volume 2. I had a chance to kind of check it out and you are just absolutely just demolishing it right now with your funding goal. Um, you have a wealth of information and come from just a really just unique and awesome background. Um, first and foremost, let's just start with the very beginning. You come from a background of uh, television and feature uh, film writing. So where did you start with that and how did that translate to uh, creating a comic? Uh, well, I have an MFA in screenwriting from UCLA. And while I was there, uh, I took the T my last year there i took the t what's called the tv track and uh i wrote a tv pilot um th that ended up being boston metaphysical society it originally started as just a period detective piece uh set in the late 1800s and till a friend of mine suggested that uh he thought it would be really good to develop it in a steampunk type of world and i had heard of it uh, steampunk, um, didn't know a lot about it, so I went and did some research and, and reading and completely agreed with him. So, I mean, that was a lot of fun. And uh, it did fairly well in competitions and was read around, but at the time, steampunk really was not mainstream and very expensive to produce. Uh, so it was suggested that I turn it into a, a graphic novel to a uh, sell it back to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Well, a funny thing happened in this journey in that I decided I loved writing comics and loved <laughs> the, the comic creator world. So guess I stayed. So <laughs> you know, I, found, I found my happy place. You decided to stay. It looked like you said about 10 years ago, correct? Uh, yeah. Marking your 10th yeah. anniversary. So this started as a, um, if I'm reading this correctly, an online uh, publication where you... Uh, yes. Yeah, I... It started as, well, officially a web comic, but it was always designed to go to print mm -hmm. at some point. So uh, I would only start, I would load up once a week, but only when I had a, an issue completely done, because I didn't want people to be waiting. And uh, Emily Hugh was my artist at the time. And, you know, she did a tremendous job, stayed with me, got all of it done, you know, a little over five years, and then went on to bigger and better. And then I um, brought on Gwen Tavares uh, for the sequels, which is what uh, Volume 2 is comprised of, is our four standalone sequels plus a bonus 10-page story. So what is Boston Metaphysical Society? I had a chance to read Volume 1, so I, I, I'm really interested in kind of just breaking down what it is exactly and what went into it. I mean, there's a lot of interesting characters. We actually have some really, like prominent people to to our history in there uh within uh the beth group so let's go ahead and start breaking some of uh, some of that down well sure but uh, for your audience uh in brief boston metaphysical society is about an ex pinkerton detective a spirit photographer and a genius scientist who battles supernatural forces in late 1800s boston um bell edison tesla and houdini are also integral to the original six issue series which is which is volume one <laughs> and you may not realize this, but Granville T. Woods, our genius scientist, is also his historical figure. Um, he was an African-American scientist who mm -hmm. existed during the same time period. And um, he did used to live in Ohio and then New York, but I brought him to Boston because I'm the writer and I can do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what, what was your uh, inspiration for bringing all these like-minded individuals together? Uh, to create Beth? Um, for me, I it would be fun to just bring all these minds together, which normally they wouldn't because most of them didn't like each other to begin with. Mm -hmm. But there was a, a greater threat out there that required them to band together to, to solve the problem. Um, and so, you know, you always still see the animosity between Tesla and Edison and Bell and, and Houdini are, are sort of kind of trying to, um, you know, officiate or referee between them all the time. And 
uh, Houdini I brought in as what I would call the humanistic element. Mm-hmm. Um, that he he brought in the, the human side to all the science that was going on, and because uh, he had the best people skills out of out of all three of them. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I really uh, I really enjoyed um, the feud between Tesla and Edison throughout the the comics because the volume one was a collection of six issues. And I think, uh, you know, for a majority of them, because I'm not trying to spoil too much, but for a majority of them, you do see uh, that back and forth between Edison and Tesla just en encapsulated rather well. What did you do? have to do any sort of like special research to kind of look into like the personalities or like the way they feuded in the past? Um, yeah, obviously, th I did a tremendous lot of research for the entire series. Uh, the bulk of the research was done when I wrote uh, an earlier script, which was uh, called Stargazer. It was for a uh, for the Sloan Fellowship. And if you're not familiar with the Sloan Fellowship, um, it's an organization that awards uh, writers and, and filmmakers um, who either write or produce uh, a film that ex uh, depicts scientists and engineers as humans and not caricatures you know, your mad scientist caricature, and the science is accurate. So uh, the script that I wrote was called Stargazer, which was a biopic about a Scottish American woman who arrived in this country pregnant, penniless, and abandoned by her husband, who got a job uh, as a maid uh, for the director of the Harvard Observatory, uh, ended up being hired as what they call the female computers in the day, and uh, discovering 10,000 stars and developing a new stellar classification system. Uh, the script actually won the Sloan Fellowship, which I'm that is so awesome. Happy to say, but the research into her life and in, to Boston during that time period was critical to the foundation of Boston Metaphysical. So I already had a lot of that research at my fingertips by doing this previous script. So it, it, it seemed like you kind of had a good idea of where you wanted to go. Uh, and you just had to basically just like fill in the dots along the way. This actually won a couple of uh, series as well. Uh, the 2003 Geeky Awards, uh, the best comic graphic novel in 2014, and then uh, Steampunk Chronicle Reader's Choice Awards in 2013, 14, 15. And then in 2019, Source Point Press picked up uh, the original six issue miniseries and then uh, the subsequent sequel. So you definitely yeah. have been getting some rather awesome acknowledgement for your work. Congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. We we were only nominated for best graphic novel for the Geeky Awards. Uh, actually, a good friend of mine won for uh, his name is George Wassell. He he did a comic called uh, Oh Hell. <laughs> that I mean, that has to be such a cool feeling though to lose to a friend. I mean, uh, so, you know, if someone. I was gonna lose, if I was going to lose, I wanted to lose to George, and so that was <laughs> very cool. So, <laughs> with uh with. These six issues building up, you said volume two is basically just a collection of the sequels to the first volume? Correct. Uh, there are four sequels out. Um, the first one is Scourge of the Mechanical Man, then The Spirit of Rebellion, Ghosts and Demons, and The Book of Demons. So where can we see um, the uh, our, our trio uh, go up against in these sequels? I guess like small, like uh, a, a, a small little synopsis of uh, what we can expect. Well, what I did with the, the sequels is do them as one shots and focus on a particular character. Like the Scourge of the Mechanical Men essentially finishes Tesla's arc from the original six issue miniseries. And I have him in Granville. It focuses on him in Granville. And because I really wanted to put these two guys in a room. And, and that was just so much fun writing that. We had such a good time <laughs> developing that. Uh, but then on, on a, a parallel timeline, uh, something happens with Caitlin, and so Samuel takes her to Philadelphia, where that kind of starts a new venture as she learns more about um, her growing psychic abilities that occurred because of her fight with the Shifter, mm -hmm. which happened in, in the uh, first six issues. I mean, it, ch it literally changes her. So she's starting to deal with these changes and each book, her abilities grow a little bit more and she becomes aware of uh, that she can talk to ghosts, which she really couldn't before. 
and she has a relationship uh, with demons that she doesn't quite understand and how she fits into the demon universe. And so that, that's really interesting that I got to explore that because my demons are very different than your traditional demons that that you see. They don't come out of a hell mouth and have nothing to do with <laughs> hell and got nothing to do with that. They, they're they actually a, a sentient species that developed parallel to us and they're slowly dying out. So um, was it... Was it a challenge, like writing this type of, of script, like with those type of creatures, or did it was it something that just kind of came natural to you? I really enjoyed like the balance between the two, like the, the you know Samuel hunting uh, these um, these these demonic forces uh, and the way they take them down. But I also really enjoyed how uh, it's uh, Caitlin, correct? Caitlin, yes. How we see Caitlin, like she's very sympathetic to the ghosts. She's like, you know, we don't know if they're bad or not. Why do we need to hurt them? So I really like that relationship balance too. Yeah, it, I wanted to put together three people, which is Samuel, Caitlin, and Granville, who come from three very different walks of life. And they all have their strengths and their capabilities, but ultimately they're stronger together than they are mm -hmm. apart. So when they work together, they're, as you can see, they're very form formidable. And um, which is why some people look to split them apart no yeah i gotcha i gotcha that makes sense <laughs> yeah i'm trying not to give away some spoilers here so <laughs> you know there's some intentional like splitting apart here that that wants to happen and to to split this group um so they are no longer as effective I, I I really uh the the way you you kind of dove into to Sam and his history and then uh his wife at one point I remember uh he 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 was very upset about having that brought up um he seems kind of just more of like a rugged like like been through it all type of character you know what was like some of your inspirations behind his design and and kind of fleshing him out as a character as a whole uh he's he's actually more interesting than you you think on on the face of it because you see handsome white man who's strong and powerful and all this other stuff <laughs> but uh he carries a lot of guilt and um having been married into a great house even though he came from a middle class uh a neighborhood um you know he didn't quite he didn't fit into the great house he doesn't you know, really fit in in his neighborhood anymore. So he created a space for himself and for others like him, which is why he's brought in, which was originally Andrew O'Sullivan, Caitlin's father, and then eventually Caitlin um, and Granville before that. So, I mean, these are characters that live in an extremely rigid social hierarchy mm -hmm. and so they're all pushing against it and and sometimes it works and sometimes they pay a very heavy price no for, uh you're pushing against that and i you know i really enjoy too like just the like and once again i've only read volume one because I, I didn't want to spoil volume two for anyone listening but um I really, really enjoyed how it started in the beginning. You, you have Caitlyn's father die, and she basically wants to join. And you see that guilt. You see, you see Samuel's guilt and like uneasiness about doing it because he doesn't want to like put her in harm too, just because he just had he just lost him. He just lost Alexander. And I thought the way you did that really captured like just the emotions that you were talking about. How he just ha carries a lot of that within himself. He does, and and I credit a, a lot to Emily Hugh in her ability to evoke emotion mm -hmm. from the characters on the page. Uh, she just did such a tremendously good job of evoking emotion, where you know I I could even you know pare back even more dialogue because the the way she drew the characters told us all all we needed to know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, I really think she did an outstanding job just with like the, the design and the texturing and, and everything, the expressions. Uh, 
everything as a whole, you could definitely tell that you came from like a film and writing background because everything was just so well put and constructed. And in the pacing, I, I, if anything, I thought the pacing was just phenomenal throughout all six issues uh, leading up to the end. Um, I, I had, like, like, like I said, such an enjoyable time uh, reading through volume one. Uh, so let's kind of start to break down, I guess, uh, Caitlin and then the other part of uh, the trio. And then we'll start diving into the Kickstarter and breaking down what to expect with volume two. So Caitlin, um, you said in other issues and um, sequels, she starts getting more uh, grown with her powers and more accustomed to what she's capable of. Uh, yes. where, where can we see her start to head towards, I guess, in the later part of the series? Uh, in Spirit of Rebellion is when she really starts seeing more of her abilities and and she's also being taught taught how to use her abilities by through another medium and uh she makes uh, friends with uh, another woman african-american woman named alma mm -hmm. bryant who lives in the boarding house they're, they're in philadelphia and she's an amateur scientist herself um and so caitlin is growing you know as her abilities start to grow she begins to realize more of what she's capable of uh, as another threat, a very unlikely threat emerges. Um, like I said, I don't want to... No, wanna no, that's fine. That. We, 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 can, we can back yeah. it up a little bit. Um, well, let's uh, wrap it up. You said uh, the the third is Grand, Granville. Did I say his Grand, name right? Granville T. Woods. Granville T. Woods. Uh, he is a historical figure, like I mentioned before. And he... He came to, I wrote a novella a while back called uh, The Demons of Liberty Row, and that's where he and Samuel first met. Um, so initially he was not, he did not trust Samuel at all. Uh, and so their relationship, you know, grew over, over time as they worked together. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he's, he's, you know, very interesting to me. He's like, sometimes he's the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always think of like Samuel, Caitlin, and Granville as like Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Mm -hmm. uh, in that, you know, Samuel is Kirk, uh, Caitlin is McCoy, and Granville is Spock. And so you get, you know, all sides of everyone sees the problem in a different way. And then Samuel has to combine this information to come up with an effective plan to solve whatever is is going on yeah and i i really i really enjoyed like the character development interaction within the early issues how caitlin uh was so nice to him and his his remarks is you know this is the first time i've ever experienced something like this i'm not used to that i really yeah. enjoyed like uh just how you were able to to really focus on like how caitlin is just different from anything else that we've experienced thus far in the story yeah uh she comes, um, you know, from, she had, uh, since her father worked with Samuel, his income, though they were at like borderline poverty, they lived a little bit better than most of the Irish do on, on the South side and the world I've created. And so there was some envy there and suspicion because, you know, Andrew was doing things that were kind of, uh, people weren't really wild about. <laughs> Um, and Caitlin's mother didn't know that she was working for Samuel. And yeah, you'll see the repercussions of that later in one yeah. of the sequels. <laughs> and well, well, without without further ado, let's let's go ahead and uh, just start diving into this Kickstarter. We'll start checking it out. So we are here on the Kickstarter of Boston Metaphysical Society Volume Two, uh, twenty seven thousand. 634 of 6,700. Wow. Congratulations on that. What would you say some of the biggest success came from with getting that funded? Uh, from being consistent and building over time with the other Kickstarters. Uh, I, everything gets delivered. Um, sometimes a little late, but not, not hugely. Mm -hmm. And so people have gotten, you know, they know they can depend on me to deliver and to deliver quality work and and the story that they want um, on on a regular basis. So part of this is just building uh, Kickstarter backers and my email list uh, over a long period of time. Yeah, you said uh, this was uh, your 11th Kickstarter? Correct. 
So, would you say that uh, the following that you've had, like, kind of, like, bled from one to another, like, with some of your Kickstarter backings? Oh, oh, yeah. No, I, I, have, a, I have a pretty good retention rate, which is so, really nice. What, what would you say, like, on, on, like, an average day for you uh, would be some of the things you do to, like, promote this Kickstarter? Because out of all the interviews I've done, you are my 41st. This is by far one of the most successful ones I've came across. So I think this would be a really good like learning spot, I guess, uh, for, for others who are watching, maybe to kind of take a, a piece of gold with them. Well, like I mentioned before, a lot of this has to do is, is building over time and, uh, and being consistent. I also start preparing my Kickstarters uh, usually three months ahead of time. Actually, no, more like a year ahead of mm -hmm. time when I know it's coming. Um, but it's about three months out that I really start uh, getting things prepared. Um, meaning, you know, I, I have a, a monthly newsletter, but I also update monthly uh, through updates, through Kickstarter, just to let people know, even if I have nothing going on other than, oh, I am on, you know, I finished this draft or just keep mm -hmm. people up to date. So they have a touchstone and, and you don't get forgotten. Um, I think people forget to do that, that you have to be consistent. You know, if you have a newsletter, send it out. It doesn't have to be every week. Like I said, I only do mine once a month because I don't have time to do anything more. Um, and, you know, update once a month on the Kickstarter to keep people informed. Do cons. I do a lot of comic cons, uh, particularly pre-pandemic I did. and But now we're starting to get into it. Mm -hmm. Get that mailing list sheet on your table you know get people signed up so how many uh interviews and podcasts would you say you averaged uh during a kickstarter campaign uh, about 20 okay yeah th that, so that seems <laughs> almost one every day or every other day almost yeah yeah um i average about 20 i usually schedule them at least thir 13 to 50 uh, 15 prior to launching yeah yeah um yeah, i would I say when we touched base that was like in march i think yeah. around so I mean, you 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 were putting this fishing line well before this Kickstarter even went live, and I'm mean, 737 backers. It definitely paid off. Um, the consistency and the growth. Um, what would be some of the the main platforms that you use and you saw like the biggest, I guess, growth and retention from? Um, probably growth. Like I said, growth comes through cons, consistency, and the mailing list. Uh what I see as far as social media platforms, I pretty much only use two consistently for promotion, and that would be Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and Instagram is more like my fun account. I mean, I do post things on there, but it's it's not consistent. Uh, a lot of backing also comes through cross promotion with other uh, creators who are launching, and that I also arrange long before I launch, launch as well. When, you know, you pay attention to what people are posting on Facebook and they're going like, oh, I'm going to launch my whatever. And it's, and if they're kind of a good fit for what you're doing, I reach out to them and say, hey, I'm going to be live at the same time. Let's cross promote. And they're going like, oh yeah. So uh, what, what, what does a cross promote look like uh, for a, for a Kickstarter, for an indie comic? Uh, essentially what I do is when I do an update, um, is, uh, you know, I announce whatever that update is. It's like, oh, we made our, you know, third stretch goal, whatever. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about any relevant news. And then I said, oh, and by the way, check out these, you know, cool Kickstarters that are going on right now. And then I post and plug about their Kickstarters. I always use visuals. Okay. Um, I only used, I only post two at a time for maximum impact. Um, and so those are usually, those are scheduled out ahead of time as well. And I do have people who come in while I'm live and if I can fit them in, cause I, I have a specific schedule, mm -hmm. uh, great. But I don't, I don't over promise people. If I, I tell them, I say like, Hey, you know, I do have prior commitments to people. If I can get you in great, I will, I'll let you know, but I, I don't want to disappoint you. Yeah. And, and so, I think, I think that's a reasonable expectation. Yeah. So, um, but like what, I said, a lot of it is, this is pre-planning. This is all pre-planning. I uh, know. I gotcha. I gotcha. So yeah. yeah. Um, 
I would you say outside of pre-planning and just being consistent and and staying on top of it any other uh, words of advice in terms of uh, running a, a successful Kickstarter uh, you do have to have a coherent Kickstarter homepage mm -hmm. and coherent reward tiers which we're, uh, we're gonna break that down too so we'll see kind of uh, how you lead by example i've gone through your your kickstarter is beautiful so i mean you definitely can tell you've had experience with crafting uh one that's not only you know formulated to succeed but just visually looks good yeah i mean you you have to you know understand that the bar has risen on kickstarter you can't just throw something up and expect people to come uh the home pages are essentially written like grant proposals and you want to communicate you know in short effective bites and and i'll tell you my pet peeve is when i go to a kickstarter page and i have to dig down to find out what they're doing you know yeah what what is this what is this kickstarter for you know tell me what it is just tell me right at the top it's like um we, we are looking to fund our 200 page graphic, you know, to print our 200 page graphic novel. Great. That, that tells me where the money's gonna go. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. You know, go, go forth and be successful. And, and then you break it down further, you know, a little bit about the story. And, and if you're gonna, if you're interested, if that's caught your interest, then, you know, you elaborate that and then mm -hmm. talk about your team and your reward tiers and, and other stuff. No, I got you. I, I, and I, I think, you know, that's something I probably would not think about either is is making sure it's right there in, in, in the bold of what you're trying to fund. Uh, I would almost probably just skip over that, just assuming people would almost like, you know what I mean? Like for me, just I, that would not be even something I would think about. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and let's get started into this. Is this a video that we could watch or is this? Sure, sure. It's just a short, it's just a short video. Yeah. All right. Let me go ahead and turn it up. Hi, my name is Madeline Holly Rosing, and I'm the writer-creator of the steampunk supernatural series, Boston Metaphysical Society. Welcome to our Kickstarter to print the trade paperback of Volume 2. If you're not familiar oh, with the you know series, what? it's, not it's showing about the... an ex-Pinkerton detective, a spirit photographer, and a genius Hold on scientist. one second, it's not showing on my screen. Let me see if there's another thing. I think it pops up a window, and I have to capture that window when it pops up. Um, no. Maybe I can without. Hi, my yeah, name is Madeline screen, Holly Rosing, and I'm the writer creator of the steampunk supernatural series, it? Boston yeah, yep. Metaphysical okay, Society. I can't, but... Welcome to our Kickstarter to print the trade paperback of volume two. If you're not familiar with the series, it's about an ex Pinkerton detective, a spirit photographer, and a genius scientist who battles supernatural forces in late 1800s Boston. Now, volume two will compile the previously published sequels the Scourge of the Mechanical Men, The Spirit of Rebellion, Ghosts and Demons, and The Book of Demons into one trade paperback. But what makes this trade special is that it will include an exclusive brand new 10 page story with art by Roberta Ingranata, who is currently drawing Doctor Who, and a cover by the gorgeous. amazing Marguerite Savage. And at 176 yeah. pages, it's going to be a huge trade paperback. If you're missing volume one, don't worry, as it'll be available in both print and digital versions. We also have a brand new steam engine lapel pin and special limited reward tiers that include our audio drama, The Ghost Ship. The best part is that it's done and ready to go to the printers. So please check out our reward tiers and pledge today. Thank you in advance for your support. Yeah, that's that, that was nice, clean, I, I loved it. Um, you even got a project we love. Was that something you got right away? Yes. So uh, project we love is basically if you get funded super quickly uh, within like the first or second day, uh, it helps promote your Kickstarter a little bit more uh, thoroughly. Well, it what it does is it puts you into a, another category of, mm -hmm. for people to search that if they they want to check out all the projects we love over at Kickstarter, I'm I'm in that group. Okay, so I gotcha. One avenue, another avenue for for people to find me. So right here is uh, the story and some of the stretch goals. Yeah, so, I mean you'll have, to, you'll have to go down because I add the stretch goals on top. But oh, I gotcha. You know, yeah, right okay. there is where we actually started, and it tells you that you know need your help to print volume two. 
It tells you exactly what we're doing with the money. And then, yeah, the exclusive 10 page story too. Uh, nice, clean, to the point. Um, so this exclusive 10 page story, this is something that's never been like shown before to your audience uh, in that's any sort correct. of medium? Correct. And it will oh, that's, a, that's exciting. It will be exclusive to volume two. All right. So who will love Boston Metaphysical Society? So fans of Dreadful, Girl uh, Genius, Roost, Steampunk, and Gaslamp Fantasy Stories, a Paranormal Historical Fiction, and or Alternate History. And if you like character-driven comics with a mix of paranormal and science fiction, then these comics are for you. So then we have a new to Boston Metaphysical Society, and this is kind of just a breakdown of what uh, kind yeah, of led to this. Yeah, if you're, if you're brand new to the world, that explains it in a little more depth. I mean, that's, that's one thing I see missing often in um, Kickstarters that are doing for issue two, three, four, and five, is their brain automatically thinks that you know what the other ones are for. And I can understand that because yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I totally get that because you're doing this. It's like, well, of course they know, you know what it is, but you want to bring in new people yep. so, well, to your series. So you always have to have like, okay if you're new to the series or you know just something to bring them up to speed this is what the overall you know story is and then you can you know break it down but uh but yeah it's it's yeah that's that's another frustrating thing when i go to like oh you know issue three or four it's like mm -hmm. okay i love this art but what is it yeah what's it about like uh, for me as a consumer if i'm jumping into like a second yeah. issue it's it's nice to know like instead of trying to guess or trying to read a summary and, and take it from there um so i i really i really enjoy uh the the little breakdown as well i i can definitely agree with that and this even goes further to tell you what's in that volume one as well so we're gonna be getting uh the six issues uh with hunter killer um with additional page uh, bonus pages as well and uh then right here is what's in volume two and you already kind of gave us a little bit of a breakdown i'm um, describing what to expect in each of those um do you want me to go ahead and read these summaries or do you feel like you kind of gave them justice already oh uh, yeah i i i don't think you need to read them I right. think it's, yeah and then what makes yeah, it special are, yeah oh. these are the first two pages of the uh 10 page exclusive with art by roberta ingranada who is currently doing doctor who and it, it's gorgeous i remember looking through this like wow like it, this is phenomenal so you say she's also working on doctor who uh as yeah, well she, she she does doctor who for titan comics how does that feel having someone uh of that caliber working on your project with you uh it's great she did the cover for volume one which you you saw up above mm -hmm. uh we had two covers we had an original one with um that emily did and then source point wanted a, a new cover for volume one so i i hired roberta to do that and so we started developing a relationship and i just i emailed her and you know off off we went and so she, what? Was able, she was able to squeeze me in in between uh, issues of, of doctor who to do the 10 pager what would force uh them to want you to come up with a new uh cover if you already had one? Oh, it's uh <laughs> It's a long story. Oh, I got you. I got you. No worries. <laughs> so right here is then we're getting into uh, the team. So uh, do you want to go ahead and maybe give a short breakdown of who you are or? Sure. Um, well, obviously, I'm the writer creator uh, of all this and, and the pro producer and manager and fulfillment <laughs> person and everything in between. Uh, like I mentioned before, Emily Hugh was the artist for volume one. Uh, Gwen Tavares took over for the four sequels. She not only did the artwork, but she did the inking and coloring as well. Um, Troy Pateri has been with me for the last 10 years and has done uh, pretty much everything except for issue four in volume one. Um, as we get down there, see some of uh, Emily's work there. Uh, Gloria Cali and uh, Fariza Kamaputra did uh, the coloring together for the first three issues and then um, Gloria was the uh, colorist for the rest. Okay. And then... Yeah, and then we have Roberta and uh, Wardia Sahad Dewa, I hope I'm not destroying her name, um, uh, is the colorist. 
You know, I actually was reading another book uh, that uh, Sinead had. Uh, I'm sorry if I butchered that too. Uh, um, that just recently uh, did. I forgot what it was called. I, some, uh, All the Devils Inside or some, something similar along that. So, yeah. yeah. She's, been doing, she's been doing a lot of work. Yeah, she's yeah. Been doing a lot. We're seeing her. She does a marvelous job. Yeah, no, it's, it's phenomenal. So, here's what other people say. And that's just kind of a. All, all the 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 praise uh, of uh, people who love this, and then some of the uh, awards you won too—the nomination for best comic and novel, and then the story behind the story. So, this is just you explaining uh, why you love writing a uh, Boston Metaphysical Society. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And then other rewards. So. Yes, you can get uh, a CD or a download of uh, the Ghost Ship, which is our mm -hmm. audio drama. And uh, there is a flash drive, but that's only available for, with the top tier because um, we have we just have a limited quantity. So we had. Yeah. To... So with the audio drama, what what led you to want to kind of do something in this sense with it being four hours long? Um, it seems like a, a decent amount of work had to have gone into it. What made you want to yeah. kind of go through this outlet? Sure. Uh, I actually blame uh, Eddie Louise. This was all her fault. Um, <laughs> Eddie Louise. I'll explain here. Eddie Louise and her husband, Chip Michael, are the co-creators and producers of an audio drama called Sage and Savant. Uh, it was on for four years. It's still on. It's fabulous. Uh, steampunk, time travel thing you can listen yeah. to. It's a great story. <laughs> and uh, she and I became friends over the years. And when we were at the Nebula uh, conference together pre-pandemic, uh, she said, you really need to do Boston, uh, Boston Metaphysical as an audio drama. And I said, you know, I agree, but I have I have no idea how to start. This is something brand new to me. And I said, I'll only do it if you and, you know, Chip come on board. So when the pandemic hit, um, I decided to pivot the business a little bit. So I reached out to them and said, hey, do you really want to do this? And they said, yes. So I brought them on as, uh, they're my production team. Okay. Uh, Eddie Louise was my script editor. Uh, Chip really carried a lot. He was our audio engineer composer and director um i did uh i was a producer and executive producer uh so yeah we did full casting so we have a full cast with 12 different actors um <sighs> fabulous voice actors and with you know this has special effects original music it's like your old time radio play that is awesome and uh, it turned out fabulous i mean everyone just did such an excellent job it just features uh, Samuel, Caitlin, and Granville. Um, as I said, later on in the sequels, they, th there is a new team member. Mm -hmm. uh, primarily, I kept it in the first six issue timeline uh, for budget reasons, because I just like, oh, I don't want, <laughs> there's only so many characters I can have in this, and there's only, I have a X amount of money for my budget to pay for actors, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, it was really a budget thing. It just seems so hard to... I mean, you you originally wanted to create like a film and now you're doing like sort of like the audio version of that. Like how yes. different How different was that? Like, because it seems like so much goes into making you visualize something that you're hearing. It is. It's, it's a different kind of writing. And I was very fortunate to have Eddie Louise um, as, you know, my script editor who... Uh, who very much helped me and educated me on the process. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously I did research before on formatting and, you know, how to write audio dramas. Um, but she really helped to, you know, hone it in, in and make it better. Yeah. You know, no, no doubt about that. Um, so I was very happy to, to have her, have her along uh, and part of the team. So yeah, that's just, that's awesome. I I really haven't stumbled across many Kickstarters that involved any sort of audio, any anything in in this nature. So it's I just kind of had to touch base upon it because it was such an awesome and like interesting concept, and I think it would really go into even fleshing out the the world building more because now you're adding voices to everybody when they oh, read these yeah. books, you know? Yeah, it 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 does. I had a friend of mine because um, we did have a Kickstarter for that uh, fall of last year and. The rewards went out earlier this year um and he said he sat down to listen to it because i guess he was doing it's one of those things where you you plug it in while you're doing something else mm -hmm. you know just to listen and his first idea was like oh i'm going to listen to you know 15 minutes and go do whatever well he finished the first episode long story short he ended up listening to the whole thing that day <laughs> and 
he said, you know, Granville sounded exactly, you know, exactly how he expected, as well as Samuel and, you know, his snarkiness and, you know, how they love, we have Thomas Edison is in this and um, uh, Emily Snyder, who, who plays Caitlin, was just fabulous. Um, yeah, we just, the cast was just amazing. And, you know, I can't thank them enough for the time and effort that they, they put into it making it so good no yeah it, I, it definitely it sounds like such I, an interesting uh listen i love listening to audio things like that background noise just helps kind of get you like going you know it just fills that uh that void so if it's something to where they're stuck listening to it then you you hit gold with it because um being able to break away from something you know i don't know for me if i get sucked into it i know that's that's something that has to be good um, yes. Yeah. So yeah. you have uh, a really awesome looking flash drive. Uh, this was it. Was this uh, like handmade, or did you have to go through somewhere special to get this like processed? Um, yeah, I did use a company. I, the artist uh, who did the, the the logo and um, the American Clipper ship. His name is Alejandro Lee. So this was real art that was designed. It's not clip mm -hmm. art or anything like that. And yeah, it went to it went to a company, and then they they print they they did it. They did all that, so I, I'm responsible for uploading everything onto the yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, you get a uh, new uh, steam engine lapel pen as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a thing where I do a new lapel pen for every graphic novel. That's that awesome. That's smart. And so, yeah, people have whole sets. They just they collect these things, um, particularly in in you know the steampunk world because I do do steampunk conventions as well. Mm -hmm. And when I have a new pin, it's like, you know, they just come, do you have a new pin? I got to add it to the collection. And, and there's a few people ha have uh, some of our older pins. Like we had an owl pin that we don't sell anymore. So those are like special, you know, you yeah. can't keep those anymore. No, that is, that is so cool. So uh, that's almost like uh, like the trading card I see a lot um, where people are like, they, they almost want to uh, have incentive to collect them all. You have these pins and these I like, are they able to do any sort of like catch up tiers with the pins, like add pins from other Kickstarters with them or are those exclusive to the Kickstarter? Um, this is, it's just, this is the one that's exclusive to the Kickstarter. You can get a full pin set. Um, there is a reward tier for the full pin set um, uh, later on if you scroll down. So you can get the full pin set. No, I gotcha. No, that that's, that's such a cool incentive though, because you would almost have to like back every Kickstarter to stay up collecting with it. You know what I mean? It goes hand in hand almost. Yeah. Or you know, if you come to cons, then yeah, you just pick up what you're missing. Mm -hmm. A coloring book as well. You have it all, it seems. Yeah, that was fun. Alejandro also did that. So is that just uh, based on some of the character portraits and stuff within it? Yes, it's the, uh, yeah, you have Samuel, Caitlin, Granville, and of course, uh, Belle, Edison, Tesla, and Houdini. And then you've got there's some, you know, more, you know, cityscape, steampunk type mm -hmm. things you can do and, and the demon and a ghost and, you know, <laughs> it's fun. And then right here's the, the pin set. Uh, so a total of seven all together. Correct. Oh, right. There's uh, the owl. Is that the owl you were talking about too? Yes. Yeah. That, that used to be a pin. Yeah. That's so cool. So what, what all, what like went into these designs? These designs look so good. Uh, a gent, uh, a gentleman named Bill Meehan had had done some of the earlier ones. Uh, Emily did the Tesla, and um, let's see, uh, Alejandro did the Plague Doctor. And I'm trying to remember. Don't remember about the rest. No, they're just so in intricate and, and awesome. It just uh, does. How does it feel to like? have your work evolve into like to where you're coming up with merchandise pins coloring books like that has to be such like a surreal feeling yeah well it, it's been very slow uh growth uh very and that was intentional it was just slow incremental growth so we just like just start off with one pin and um yeah the first one was the owl pin and then we went to tesla and then i think we added a dirigible um uh, I'd have to go look at the order now because oh, you're you know, fine. You're fine. Yeah uh, I know I think we're showing the teacup there. We do have some teacups left, but uh, Those will be going when those are gone. Those will be gone. Okay, so that that's gonna be the next special one up uh, coming up uh, after the owl <laughs> and, and then in the next here's one, the novel. Yeah, that is a prequel to the graphic novel 
and uh, essentially tells the story of Elizabeth Hunter, Samuel's wife. Okay, okay, so... Um, do we ever find out what happened to Samuel Wife, or is this you have to read the novel to figure that out? You have to read the novel. Okay, that yeah, so that that is that's an interesting take as well. Was it harder to write the novel or the comic? It's just different. It's a different process mm -hmm. uh, because with the comic, you always have to be thinking about page count because you know I only had X amount of dollars to pay for X amount of pages, so you had to really hone the story in and and um you know get to the point quickly and not a lot of room to to flesh things out and so with a, a storm of secrets i was able to do that and, and that was really great so you get to um if, if you've read all the the graphic novels in, including the, the sequels as well you get to meet certain characters that are either only mentioned or um you just see glimpses of glimpses of them, and but you see them in an in an earlier time, mm -hmm. um, and and you get a better idea of how this alternate history, the alternate world, functions. I think it's really genius, not only with the world building that you're doing, but the type of world building, having the audio, having the novel, having the graphic novels, like because it almost breaks up the different mediums and it, it like encourages people from different platforms to like come and consume your content it's it's just it's Correct. such yeah. smart marketing like what yeah. what made you want to go with a novel uh instead of maybe doing another like short mini series uh budget 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 uh i had decided a while back that everything prior to the original six issue mini series would be in prose and everything in the future timeline will be in graphic novel format and I also don't do novelizations, so everything you see here is a new story. Okay. It's not a recap of a graphic novel or anything like that. And this was actually awarded a silver medal uh, as well as the Wright uh, Companion Award for Best Overall Top Pick, Adult Children's and Young Adult Categories in 2019 uh, Feathered Quill Book Award. So congratulations on that. You are just winning awards Thank left you. and right. Thank you. I, I was very pleased about that. And, and that's then, our anthology uh, has uh, the short stories and novellas. And that I started writing when we were in production uh, mm -hmm. with the original six issue miniseries because uh, I wanted to build canon and this was a nice way to do it. So it includes the stories of how Granville and uh, Samuel met, their first cases together, and then uh, what set Caitlin on her path. Yeah, nice little touch. And then where the money goes. So you are very transparent with your Kickstarter as well, I've noticed. Not only well organized and structured, but uh, the transparency is pretty good as well. Yeah, I, I think that's one reason why people keep coming back is, you know, I'm always trying, for, particularly for the backers and mm -hmm. particularly international backers, because, man, that postage is a killer. And I uh, discovered PirateShip.com through uh, a friend of mine, Christy Shen. And, but then they started what's called a simple export rate, which is for uh, non-US um, shipping. And, uh, you know, I saved a lot of money on that. I was able to save money for the backers because um, it was a lot cheaper than USPS. Yeah, I heard the international shipping was like some of the most like breaking for campaigns, especially like if you don't charge that person the shipping and you pay it out of pocket, it can really, bankrupt a lot of people depending on how many people out of state order uh so it looks like you were able to actually yeah obtain that discount for over 50 countries i heard about the pirate ship a little bit mm -hmm. um i want to say from dan price from uh bigfoot knows karate he was telling me a little bit about it um yeah you do it you don't have they don't charge you anything for you know having an account but you do have to ask for the simple export rate to be put in your rate categories so it doesn't automatically show up. You do have to ask for it. And then it, okay. it shows up. As soon as you ask for it, it shows up like within 24 hours. And um, it's uh, compared to how you traditionally used to do it. Like, is it a, like a, a world in like a day and night difference? It's, uh, it's different, particularly for um, the bigger packages, because there is a, a limit of four pounds. Mm -hmm. And my large, pa my all book packages tend to be over four pounds. 
so what we do is we split it into two packages and so we just charge essentially double what the two to three pound rate is because that's what the weight's going to fall into that range mm -hmm. and that has saved backers anywhere from 20 to 50 dollars wow wow that's huge yeah that's that's remarkable huge, huge savings and um unfortunately they still have to pay that if if they're in the eu but there's there's nothing i can do about that yeah yeah i, I let them know it's you know that's you, you do have to pay <laughs> mm -hmm. so uh for this campaign you decided not to use uh kickstarter add-ons what was all uh, your reasoning behind that um i i uh, use backer kit even though it's pretty expensive uh because i've found it's the back end and the administration of it is a lot easier. I I haven't, uh, last year, I guess Kickstarter really hadn't gotten up to speed on the back end admin for the add-ons yet. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of a pain in the ass. So I just, for me, it's just easier to do add-ons all in one place. So what is BackerKit for anyone that's listening and not having a, a good grasp on what it can provide? Uh, BackerKit is essentially a store uh, that you open after your Kickstarter is over. Um, you can do a pre-order store, but what happens when you send out surveys to your backers, They can that's when they can add on stuff. Like if they got just a book, but they decided they wanted to get a pin set, they can order just a pin set, or they can order just a CD, or, you know, another thing of books. Um, it gives them the opportunity to add more to their, uh, to their packages that are more um, suited to their individual taste. Yeah. Would, would this be something that you would recommend for someone that might have a little bit more experience in the kickstarter scene like is this something like you would want to do for your first kickstarter because it seems like probably not. I, I would away. Probably say, yeah i would probably use the kickstarter add-ons if you're just starting out um like i said a uh, backer kit tends to be expensive and if you have a lot of back inventory that you can sell it it, it can be profitable um if you don't if you just are, have your one or two books you know you have your first and second issue you know, just use the add-ons, you know, through Kickstarter. Um, that's going to make your life simpler, I think. It, but, it seems like the ability to have the add-ons would help the funding get hit quicker as well. I, I'm not sure if that's maybe I'm off on that. Um, with the backer kit, it seems like you're going to be getting a, a decent amount of funding even after the campaign's over because of all the add-ons at the end. So it seems like it's yeah. it's nice in that aspect too. Yeah, it's like if you if you have a fairly decent library of stuff that you can sell, after the fact, then yeah, backer kit, um, it, it works very well. There are new options out there. I have not used them, so I can't comment on them. Mm -hmm. um, but there are competitors out there to backer kit, uh, and but you'd need to talk to someone who's actually used them to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so with, with so without add-ons, you are actually having stretch goals. So your first stretch goal uh, was for nine thousand two hundred, and that was a digital comic bundle. Uh, so yep. this is going to be available to everyone who has pledged a re or pledged to a reward. Correct. And uh, these are uh, six different books from uh, various different uh, writers and creators that you know. Yes. So yep. with the, the digital comic bundle, is this something you would recommend? Because I see a lot of people, yeah, do like trying to, like going down this route, and it seems like it's having a lot of great success, not only in in helping hit those stretch goals, but getting other creators out there as well to a new audience. Yeah, no, it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, yeah no, definitely some I, awesome I books in here too. You'll see, uh, you know, Boston Metaphysical issue number one and other people's bundles. You're gonna, you're gonna see that. And your your bundle, it like is gonna be like six times the length of most of these probably too, uh, with the volume one because it's like six books in one. A lot of awesome books here though too. Yeah, no, they're they're all a lot of fun. And then stretch goal number two is eleven thousand eight hundred. What uh, what was inspiring you for these different price tiers? Like, is there any certain uh, number or kind of a calculation that went into hitting that goal in particular? Um, how should I put this? 
it depends on how the Kickstarter is going. Okay, I gotcha. I I keep it fluid. Mm -hmm. So these are going to be two Boston Metaphysical Society magnets. Magnet. Face, uh, magnets yes. featuring uh, two steam uh, the featuring the steam engine and Alma, one of our scientists. Yes. Uh, and then this is going to be uh, to everyone that's pledged to a physical reward. reward yes. Stretch goal number three is uh, 14,500 and six more digital comics. So anyone who's pledged to reward is going to get 12 altogether. Actually, 18 at this point. It, wow, that is insane. That, yeah, that, that is awesome. Yeah. So another awesome. Uh, so how did you go? Did, were, were these people that you kind of vetted through or the friends that you met along the way? Or did you just put out like a feeler posting whoever wanted to collaborate? Uh, there is actually a, a group of us that are, are part of some of these come from a, a group where mm -hmm. we have all agreed to share and some of them come from personal contacts. Okay. Stretch goal number four, 17,500, uh, two Boston Metaphysical Society magnets featuring Samuel yeah. Hunter in. Yeah. So nice little magnet sets as well. And then here's the stretch goal number five, 20,000, uh, six more comics as well. These ones look a little bit more detailed and uh, a little bit more uh, maybe gory or, or graphic. Yeah, some, some of these are, are more horror oriented, yeah. Which that would still kind of fit the theme with the the demon aspect of it. Yeah. So stretch goal number six twenty four five hundred twenty four thousand five hundred. Everyone who's pledged get uh, to a physical reward will get this very cool metal bookmark. So an awesome little bookmark. Is this going to be a uh, the air balloon that we see within the comics as well? Uh, no. This this was designed specifically for the bookmark. This is the first time I've done this. Th this is actually a metal metal bookmark with the the airship is cut out and it has mm -hmm. a cup finish so oh, this, yeah. this is going to be really cool and um i was really glad we you know we made that stretch goal um there i think people are going to love it and then for stretch goal number seven twenty seven thousand, uh a digital wallpaper of the cover of volume two correct yeah and then risk and challenges virtually are none because the book's already done. So you just have to ship it off to the printer to get it printed at this point, correct? Yes. And then I have to wait for it to arrive. So, yeah. That, just that's at, at, at the mercy of shipping at that point. Yeah. So uh, yeah. do you want to go through the tiers really quick? Sure. Uh, you can get the uh, basic tier of... Um, you know, just volume one, and, you know, it's $10, uh, it's 176 pages. And uh, yeah, that's your basic tier. Uh, if you're missing both, then, uh, or just number one, because there's some people who had missed some of the issues from number one. Mm -hmm. So I've actually put that up later because they said, can you do that? Because I'm missing some issues from number one. And, and I'm like, sure. So I threw that up. Um, you can get uh, digital editions of one and two, uh, the new to Boston, uh, yet yeah, is the print um, editions of that's uh, yeah that's you can get obviously just the print edition of volume two mm -hmm. and um, also signed by the creator for uh, 25 that's that's a good price uh, was uh, did you I mean I see a lot of people wanting to charge extra for the signature was there a reason uh, why you didn't want to or was that included in the that's price just, it's all it's all included I gotcha yeah it's all included and then five bucks more, you get the steam engine pin. Uh, five, so five bucks, that's that's an outstanding price too for five bucks. Uh, 32, you get the digital bundle, so the comics and the pros. Yes. And then the starter kick for 35. That, uh, yeah, that gets you um, volume one and the novel. Which, that, man, that novel sounds awesome. Is there a way to get the novel separately or is that only exclusive to the Kickstarter? No, you can pick that up at Amazon or, you know, any ebook platform. And then a taste of everything digital. So this will be PDFs of everything uh, available. Correct. And then new to Boston is the uh, the graph, um, the signed copy of volume one to Boston uh, Metaphysical Society coloring book. Um, yeah, as so well as a thing. And, yeah, and, and you get the coloring book too. And then for our the hardworking. Re that's the retail. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, and the, re the retail packages and the premium digital package that that includes PDFs and everything plus a digital download of the audio drama. Okay. And then uh, if another uh, retail one then, of the premium one? Correct, correct. Okay. And then the Super Starter Kit. Yeah, that includes a CD. 
Okay. And then the the uh, the pin set uh, for the uh, the pledge of seventy or more. Yes. Nothing but books for eighty, so uh, everything book related included, I assume. Yeah, that's all the physical books. Yeah. And then we have audio drama package for ninety five. Yeah, so that focuses on the audio drama. And then all things BMS for 160. So this will be all the packages included up to, to this point? Yeah, yeah, that's um, pretty much everything. And you, that gets that's the only tier where you can get the flash drive. Okay, all right, no, I got gotcha. you. And it's only six left of 35, so that was a hot seller for you too. Yeah. And then the Kickstarter consult uh, consultation uh, package. So uh, being someone who's ran so many, this is definitely something people should be looking at. You've had uh, 11 successful Kickstarters to date. So what can people expect to get uh, if they pledge to this tier? Uh, they get a print copy of my book, Kickstarter of uh, Kickstarter for the Independent Creator. Um, I, you know, will review and critique their their homepage um, prior to their launch. Uh, we'll sit down and, and talk about marketing and, um, you know, I'll write up some stuff for them for, you know, to help them put together a marketing plan. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, anything else, it, it really depends on the creator because a lot of people are, are they, everyone's starting at a different level. Yeah. So it, when I talk to them, I'll, I'll know where we need to start. <laughs> No, I got you. It, may, it makes sense. Yeah. Some people are just starting out. Some people have a script. Some people are in the process of actually fleshing out the comic. I, I definitely understand. It would it kind of be a, a little harder to uh, guess where everyone is uh, at that moment. But well, yeah. But actually, what I mean by where they're at is, do they have a mailing list? Do, True. You know, yeah. It, it's all of the marketing stuff. Do you know what does their mailing list look like? What does their con season looks like? Um, you know what does their uh social media look like so mm -hmm. it's all the marketing angle that has to do with pre-launching so that is pretty much your kickstarter in a nutshell was there anything else that you wanted us to focus on while we were had this still pulled up uh no i think that is pretty much it so i think we are coming to a point where we're gonna be wrapping it up okay. for anyone that is still watching um, or watching because I'm going to get this edited and put out uh, in a few days. Um, anyone th that's still on the fence about backing your Kickstarter, what would what would you like to say to them directly to kind of address them to help push them over that, that little hump? Oh, that's always the tough part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, one of the things is you're going to get things here that you're not going to get anywhere else. Um, and, you know, and that includes the magnets. Uh, and all the extra goodies that you know you're not going to get between the digital comics and the magnets and the bookmarks um and also just a fantastic story mm -hmm. uh with with some terrific creators on board you know big kudos of course emily hugh and gwen tavares um and uh yeah like i mentioned there it's like if, if you like you know steampunk and paranormal and alternate history then this really is, this is the comic for you. <laughs> I definitely, and I can vouch behind that um, after reading volume one, I, I, I definitely love the atmosphere and just everything that went into it. What an awesome interview. I, I appreciate so much that you took the time out of your day to come on here and chat with us and break this down. I do have one last question. It's one of my favorite questions to ask, because like I said, as much as we make this like a spotlight for you and your content, mm -hmm. I'd like it to be a tool for other people potentially. So with that being said, what would you say to any content creator out there that's struggling to get their idea, you know, from their, from, from their head to paper, like they're struggling to get their idea to take off? What words of advice would you give them to kind of just push through that? that barrier and just get to work um take a class you know take a class on sequential art because that's that's exactly what i did and uh make sure it's a good class uh you're getting good constructive feedback because it really helps to talk to other people it helps to brainstorm with other people and i can't tell you how many times like i talk to fans and they inspire story ideas for me because they'll talk about the characters and they'll they'll talk about the world and i'll go like oh that's interesting and i won't do something exactly what they're saying but it's it's the question they ask and then i'm like hmm that's a really interesting question how am i going to answer that 
And so getting feedback from, you know, people you trust, mm -hmm. I, I think is vital and helps in the creative process because we don't create in a vacuum. And that's, and that's that's what people you 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 really have to understand. Um, creation does not happen in the back. I know it, I know it seems that way because you got to sit in a room all by yourself with your <laughs> laptop or whatever. But it's really it's the input you're getting from other people and how your brain processes that that makes your story yours. That was such an awesome response. I like I said, this is my forty first interview. Um, and out of everyone I've asked that question, because I ask every single one, uh, 35 of them have probably, th probably 35 said, just do it. Uh, you know, and then uh, the other couple, of, but you are the first one that said, take a class. And that, that like was such an interesting concept because it really does make you open up a new path of thinking that you weren't able to access pre previously. You know, the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over with and expecting yeah. the same different results. And that, that, yeah, that right there definitely was such an awesome response. I appreciate that. But with that being said, guys, I think it is time to wrap things up. If you haven't already, be sure to get on Kickstarter and back this project, Boston Metaphysical Society Volume 2. We will have the link to the Kickstarter in the comments down below. Um, a big thank you to you for coming on. I appreciate uh, just this opportunity to break things down. Hope you guys have a fantastic Saturday night. But most importantly, guys, keep it geekly.